Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us for day two of the 2022 annual meeting of the California Oak Mortality Task Force. If you were here with us yesterday, the following housekeeping items will sound familiar. First though, today's session focuses on Phytophthora remorum and sudden oak death and will be moderated by Chris Lee from CAL FIRE. Each of the speakers today has been allotted a few minutes to answer questions at the end of their presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the chat so that Chris and I can facilitate getting them answered. Any questions that we can't get to during the speaker's time, we will save for the end of this session or we will follow up with you offline. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted online at the suddenoakdeath.org website in the coming weeks. And with that, I will hand the meeting over officially to Chris. Thank you, Janice, um, and welcome everybody. Thanks for sharing part of your afternoon with us today to get some updates on Phytophthora remorum and sudden oak death. The first thing I want to say today is that we, beside, besides thank you to Janice and to Susan Frankel for coordinating this meeting, um, is to let you know that there's been a slight change to the agenda because our first presenter on the agenda today, Sarah Navarro from the Forest Service in Oregon, is under the weather today. And so she won't be able to present her update on what's going on in Oregon wildlands. Um, and so I'll jump right in in a moment into talking about California wildlands. But the first thing that I wanted to do is, is give one bit of breaking news that does have to do with Oregon. Um, the Oregon Department of Agriculture just released some, some press about a new find of Phytophthora remorum in Lincoln City, Oregon, which is fairly far to the north of the current USDA APHIS quarantine um, areas for sudden oak death and, and Phytophthora remorum. There is a link to that press release um, in the chat if any of you are interested. And I want to share um, one interesting bit of information um, here, and that is that a new host seems to have been found as part of this find. Um, so, uh, sword fern, Polisticum munitum, or however you say it properly, um, has is infected with Phytophthora remorum on this site, and the forest pathologists in Oregon will be following up with um, proving pathogenicity on this host. Um, something, something new, and something we don't know about yet. Uh, we don't know much about yet. Um, there's, I will let you peruse the press release. Uh, it, it seems that rhododendrons are also involved at this location, but there's not a lot of information beyond that, and ODA will be following up with more investigative work. And um, if anybody has um, any questions about that or can't get to that press release, um, let us know either in the chat or after presentations today. Okay, so I am now going to stop that share and share my other screen, which is an update on sudden oak death in California wildlands. There we go. Let me know if you can't see that, Janice. And if so, then we'll forge forward here. This is basically an update because you'll hear after I talk, you will also hear updates on what citizen scientists are finding out there on the ground uh, in 2022 with, re with relation to sudden oak death. And you'll also hear what we're finding in streams along the coast of California that are being monitored for Phytophthora remorum. And so what I'll tackle in this is what we've seen in terms of the Forest Service Forest Health Monitoring Aerial Detection Survey and what I've seen um, going around the, the North Coastal Counties um, looking from the ground. And a running theme throughout this little bit of the talk will be some lookalikes for sudden oak death. And, but before we get into that, I thought as a bit of background information, it could be useful to have a look at our precipitation trend um, in several locations along the North Coast from Santa Cruz up almost to Oregon. So Ben Lomond is down there in Santa Cruz County, Olima is in Marin County, and then we have Sonoma County, Humboldt County, and Del Norte County. And so 
this is no surprise, but it just puts it in a graphical format that precipitation has been lower than the mean for the past few winters. And by winter on this graph, I really mean November through June. So it's more like wet season rather than winter specifically. Um, this has affected the picture of sudden oak death as I think that will be um, borne out through me, through what I have to say and through the next couple of speakers as well. Trying to think if there's anything else. I don't think there's anything else to be said about that at the moment. Um, so the, the Forest Health Monitoring Aerial Detection Survey from the Forest Service, they fly over the wildlands in California every year looking for a variety of mortality agents. Really what they're looking for is just tree mortality and they map it and they base their designation of mortality agents on what most people who've been out there observing have established over the years are those mortality agents. And there are a number of them that, of course, they can't really definitively to, to, uh, assign the mortality agents. And tan oak mortality is one of those things. So you'll see this is their preliminary report, which they were gracious enough to share with us um, for Northwest California. And you'll see this quote here that tan oak mortality most likely caused in some areas by sudden oak death, was recorded on about 4,300 acres. And that's a significant decrease from 2021 and other recent years. And if you um, look at that um, graph, I'll go back to that precipitation graph one more time, just so you can look at the last high precipitation year along the North Coast being the winter of 2018, 2019, and typically, there is a lag between high precipitation years and tan oak mortality. And so it makes sense that um, this would be falling off. In the central coast, it's largely the same situation. Tan oak mortality detected across 4,000 acres or so, um, light to moderate intensity, concentrated on San Francisco Peninsula along Big Sur and the Southern Santa Lucia range. And so, the next thing that I wanted to do is just show a few galleries of pictures of some of the sudden oak death. And, you know, these start at when you've been looking at sudden oak death for a while and you've been going to sudden oak death talks for a while, these all start to look very much the same. Um, but these are some of the areas where I did see some active sudden oak death mortality this year. This one's in Santa Clara County. This is one of the areas where the aerial detection survey sent me to look because they had seen noticeable coast live oak mortality from the air. And I went out to this reservoir, not very far from Almaden Reservoir, South Bay area. And there are quite a few coast live oaks dotted across the landscape, dying in individual fashion here. This is not a lab confirmed sudden oak death positive. So this is one of the examples that I can't tell you 100% is said in oak death, but it does have a lot of markers, including older coast live oak mortality and a lot of other organisms that are typically associated with sudden oak death mortality. It also has a lot of symptomatic bay laurel in the vicinity and the kind of humid climate around these reservoirs that you might expect to host this sort of sudden oak death um, associated uh, mortality. Um, lots of big coast live oaks that are in this, in this situation here. As we move up north along the coast a little bit, um, in, on the border between Sonoma County and Mendocino County, right along the coast. Earlier this year, um, here's an example of tan oak mortality um, from sudden oak death as well. And this particular tree had other secondary pathogens involved also, but the S Northern Sonoma coast and, and Western Sonoma County and Western Marin County in particular are places where sudden oak death has been a most consistent presence over the years um, because the conditions seem to be very good for it there. Here's an example from farther north in Humboldt County. This is the Red Wood Creek watershed. This is a place where there are trees across the creek from where it's easily accessible that 
certainly look like sudden oak death and they're very close to previously infested areas. And so I expect that Phytophthora remorum did cause this mortality. Although again, one, I didn't cross the creek and get a sample from the nearby trees. So it's not a hundred percent sure. And all of this uncertainty is something to consider. And I'm gonna revisit that point as I get to the end of my slides here in just a minute. And then as we move up to the farthest corner, I see that my little lines on my call out box are in the wrong place here. Um, oh no, they're not, they're not because the, the little inset map does go up into Oregon. So in the very corner of California here, um, this is a picture that Jana Valakovic took in 2020. Um, so Kasara Nichols from the Oregon Department of Forestry happened to be driving up this road in Del Norte County on her way back to Oregon and she saw this dead tan oak. And Yana investigated further and found that we did have um, Phytophthora morum infestation in this area. And further investigation uncovered that this was actually the EU1 strain of Phytophthora remorum. And so this is what it looked like back in 2020. And um, in the year previous, we had detected the NA1 strain a few miles south of this in Del Norte County, across the Smith River um, in an old growth redwood stand on Tan Oaks. And so uh, the NA1, we waited to see, um, to continue to monitor that infestation, but the EU1, we wanted to move on. And so we did implement a, a type of slow the spread um, management activity here at this spot uh, for the EU1 infestation. And what you'll see, um, we did a lot of, of looking in the woods around about that area also to see what else we could find. And the map on the right is also from Yana and it shows um, some of our sampling points. And this is really only some of the sampling points that we did and we continue to do in this area. Um, the sampling points in the orange oval there are the ones that encompass our EU1 infestation. All the others were ones that did not turn out to be positive for Phytophthora remorum. Since that time, um, we have seen that there are a couple more um, infected trees and they're very close right there. Um, there's a creek between that initial infested area and the new trees that we found. And we are actively working with the landowners and their neighbors to try to figure out what sort of response action we can mount toward these new couple of uh, satellite infested trees. Um, that's sort of the situation uh, in Del Norte County, other than the fact that the original NA1 infestation that we found, we've continued to try to recover that pathogen again from the same trees that we got it from um, in 2019, and we haven't been able to re-recover the NA1 um, pathogen at all from that area which is pretty interesting. We have been able to recover from the same tree that was first infested. We've recovered other pathogens, including Phytophthora nemorosa, Diplodia corticola, and a very active armillaria infection at the base of the tree. Um, and, and the original tree um, is dying, but we haven't been able to recover Phytophthora remorum from that NA1 area again, and we haven't re-recovered NA1 Phytophthora remorum anywhere else in Del Norte County either, um, in spite of all our extensive searching. So that's a little bit of maybe positive or good news. And then I wanted to sort of end uh, the, the monitoring presentation here today um, by saying that, uh, just giving some, some diagnostician beware slides just to show you the lookalikes that um, we're encountering. And if you happen to tune into this same presentation last year, you, you may or may not remember that I gave a talk on, on a lot of these lookalikes. And the reason is because when we move into these years with less precipitation rather than more, 
um, the trees are stressed and other pathogens are showing up and they can be very similar in their effects to Phytophthora remorum. And so the left one is from Redwood National Park in Humboldt County. The right one is from um, a Phytophthora remorum infected tree in Mendocino County. And um, so this sort of shows a few things. We, we are moving into those um, drier phase, or we've been in those drier phases where um, sod is going lighter on the landscape over the past few years. You know, it's a condition that we can't take for granted. And when that happens, we're gonna start to see other things popping up if, if trees are stressed. And um, so there's that example. And um, here's a couple more. Um, Chris, you have about three more minutes. Thanks, Janice. Um, here's an example where, again, things are turned topsy-turvy in, in the same part of California here. On the left, we've got Mendocino County, which is where my previous sod example on the previous slide came from, um, Diplodia corticula. On the right is that same Phytophthora remorum photo from Yana of, of sudden oak death in Del Norte County. And so you can see that you can't drive by on the road and tell that one is sudden oak death and one is not. And I don't know, the one on the left is very close to the place um, that is a little roadside attraction in northern Mendocino County that you see up at the top of the screen. Um, and maybe it's just caught in the vortex of mystical energy um, that is in that roadside attraction called Confusion Hill, because it has certainly provided plenty of confusion for me and my colleagues in southern Humboldt and northern Mendocino counties over the past few years. And here are some others. Um, the left two pictures are from the South Bay again, Los Altos Hills. You can see on the left that just generally oaks are not all thriving in many of the locations where they um, where they are experiencing water stress. The picture second from left is one of those oaks from that left-hand picture um, that is infected with a species of, of Cytospora, you know, commonly known as a, as a stress following sort of secondary agent. And other species of Cytospora are being commonly isolated from other tree species um, in other parts of California as well. Um, on the right, there's a coast live oak um, that is not looking great. It's barely clinging to life up on Mount Diablo. And the only sort of biotic agent that I could find on it was um, a wood boring beetle at the base of the tree that was, the, the infestation was very heavy. Um, but the stress related symptoms on the trees are quite common on Mount Diablo on coast live oaks and um, canyon live oaks as well. And so we're seeing a lot of that basically take home message here being um, less precipitation, um, more drought leads to other unfortunate problems that make the, the job of monitoring sudden oak death in California from the ground and from the air more difficult. And the aerial detection survey is very wise to default to tan oak mortality rather than labeling everything sudden oak death. And with that, I want to thank a whole bunch of people and probably some that I've forgotten from um, to, to put on this list who assist in sudden oak death monitoring in California uh, year after year. And that is it for the sudden oak death update in Northern California. I did want to mention um, if Carrie Frangioso is on this um, uh, participant list today, or if Kim Carella is here, um, and we have a chance to talk at the end, um, it would be great to, you know, hear from you as to what's going on in the Big Sur area more specifically, because that's a, that's something that I didn't cover in this talk, and so it would be interesting to hear that perspective. Thanks so much. I'm going to stop sharing now. All right. And so with that, um, we are ready to move into a discussion of stream monitoring, or actually, I guess I should look and see if I have a couple of minutes for any questions, if anybody has any. 
the genotype for the new Lincoln City detection, um, a question from Yana, and that's a good one. That is EU1. Yeah, that's it. That that's that's the EU1 strain. So that's a good one. Um, oh, and Susan answered that. I'm behind the times with the chat here. Sorry about that. Um, so if, if you have any questions about any of that, um, we'll have more time to talk about it at the end. And now we can move into our discussion of stream water monitoring for Phytophthora morum in 2022 in California. And that discussion is going to be given to us by Wallace Robinson. Um, Wallace works as a staff research associate with the University of California Cooperative Extension in Humboldt and Del Norte counties and has extensive experience with a lot of aspects of forest health. Um, their master's degree was a large dendroecological project looking at Northern California tree species responses to drought stress. They've worked in a large mycology lab in the past. They've worked with ant species and probably all sorts of other things. And I happen to know that Wallace is also a master tubist. Um, so um, Wallace, with that, I will um, leave the stage to you. Thank you so much, Chris, for that um, extremely nice um, introduction. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Can someone confirm that, I guess? Yes, we can see it. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, I will be giving the update for the stream monitoring program this year. Um, this is primarily coordinated through uh, Dave Rizzo's lab and UC Davis, and we partner with uh, them as well as a bunch of other people um, to make this program continue happening. Um, so as usual for this program, streams were baited about five times between March and June, depending on the site. Um, and in partnership with many collaborators, um, about 60 sites across five counties were monitored this year with the majority of our sites um, being in Del Norte, Humboldt, uh, and Siskiyou counties on the North Coast, as well as a few in Monterey and San Luis Obispo counties uh, to the South. Um, these sites were largely the same as those monitored last year, but um, a number of monitoring sites were added um, in Del Norte, especially to make sure that that area immediately surrounding the EU-1 infestation uh, detected in 2020 was adequately monitored. Um, so with that, I'm going to go over these results um, from south to north. Uh, so I'm going to start with Monterey and San Luis Obispo counties. Uh, five sites were monitored across these two counties. One was in Monterey and four were in San Luis Obispo. Uh, and Phytophthora remorum was detected in Salmon Creek Salmon Creek in Monterey County, um, which has positive, previously tested positive um, from 2018 through 2020. Um, and these results seem to be consistent with the evidence from vegetation surveys, it sounds like, conducted along this creek. Um, but Kim Corella can also answer more questions about that if there are any. Um, Phytophthora remorum was not detected across the other four sites, all of which have been positive for at least uh, one year previously with uh, San Carpoforo Creek testing positive in 2012, 2017, 2019, and 2020, and the other three testing positive in 2019 only. Um, none of these four streams tested positive uh, last year either, which makes this the second year in a row without a positive detection. Uh, moving on to Humboldt County, um, there were no positive detections um, in this county at all this year. Um, in Southern Humboldt, which is largely monitored by the Humboldt Redwood Company and the Matol Restoration Council, uh, Phytophthora remorum uh, was in particular not detected in two previously positive streams, which were Yeager Creek and Chad Creek, which you can see on this map. Um, Yeager Creek is the northern one and Chad Creek is in that Bear Creek Eel River watershed. Um, so both Yeager and Chad Creek have uh, tested positive for a handful of years in the past decade, with Chad Creek first testing positive in 2015 um, and Jaeger in um, 2018. Um, similarly, we didn't really see any positives uh, in the northern and central uh, portions of Humboldt this year. So um, if you can see my clicker, um, this cluster of watersheds in northeastern Humboldt um, is 
that have consistently tested positive are monitored by the Peru Department of Natural Resources, um, and they continue to test negative this year. Um, the streams just to the west of this cluster, um, which are in the gray, are um, monitored by Hoopa and Yurok Tribal Forestries. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the status of all of these monitoring sites are since they collaborate directly with UC Davis, um, but none of them tested positive in 2021, and that continued to be the case this year. Um, we also partnered with the Bureau of Land Management this year to reinstate um, a monitoring site at Lax Creek, which was last monitored in 2016. Um, and our BLM partners had a really hard time reaching Lax Creek due to snow and other adverse weather conditions this year. So we don't have data from every part of the monitoring season, but from what we do have, uh, we didn't detect Phytophthora morum uh, in Lax Creek um, during this season. Um, in central Humboldt, uh, Phytophthora morum was not detected in either Widow White or Mill Creek, which is notable since they're often our most consistently positive sites within the monitoring season and have frequently tested positive since um, 2007. So overall, Humboldt had a pretty uneventful stream monitoring season, um, but there aren't particularly clear cut answers as to why this is. Um, Widow White and Mill Creek in particular continue to be um, a bit of a mystery for us since uh, there are very few viable host plants in this area. Uh, and yet these two urban creeks continue to test positive um, some years and negative others. Um, so this might suggest that the, the disease is persisting in the area via an unknown terrestrial or aquatic host, which um, I guess we just heard about one possible uh, terrestrial host in, in the form of sword fern. Uh, which could certainly be present in this area, um, but this inconsistency could also be partly or entirely weather driven in nature, um, and we just don't really have clear cut answers on that. So um, in any case, it continues to be an interesting and important place to monitor as we sort through these options. So finally, in Del Norte, um, we had the only positive stream bait detections on the north coast for this year. And these were from three sites um, along two creeks near the known EU1 infestation zone, which you can see is this, this red area right here. In particular, the zone is like right here. Um, so uh, sudden oak death was detected in uh, Little Mill Creek for the first time. Um, but this creek is adjacent to trees um, that have tested positive since 2020 for sudden oak death, and we know but there's still a little bit of sod around in the area. So it's not too surprising that it's testing positive now, um, although it is interesting that it took until now to test positive despite uh, there being terrestrial plant material um, that was positive for said oak death before then. Um, Hudson Pillar Creek was positive once in 2020 and tested positive at two sites this year. Um, the original site of this positive detection was positive again um, as was one of the two new sites that we established upstream from the original site uh, to try to pinpoint where the um, sod infestation stopped being detectable. Um, in addition to these sites, we monitored a bunch of other accessible creeks uh, within the immediate watershed, uh, as well as a handful of watersheds to the north, south, and east of the known infestation, um, but no other sites have returned positive this year. Um, so finally, the site monitored by the Department of Natural Resources in Siskiyou County was negative this year as well, uh, which you can see um, over here. And that is consistent with the results from past monitoring efforts. So um, with that, I think that is a pretty brief overview of all of the stream monitoring results for this year. Um, so I guess if anyone has anything to add uh, or has questions, now would be the time to do those things. Thanks, Wallace. Are there any uh, questions for Wallace um, at this point about stream monitoring? Yes, uh, this is Mateo. Hi, Wallace. Sorry, I, I just, I, I logged on a little bit late, but last year we had several cases where the stream baiting was negative and we had quite a lot of sod on the hosts. 
but those hosts were not sporulating. And so in a mega drought situation, and I'll show some data today that it's really interesting. Um, I think that a negative has to be taken with a pinch of salt because we know now, I mean, Marine was negative and Salmon Creek was negative and we literally had, you know, tens of positives in those areas and the streams were negative. So I think it's important. I mean, the positives are valid, but the negatives are not really informative. I think, unfortunately, since the drought started. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think that that's um, a helpful thing to keep in mind. And I, I agree with that. Um, we have several sites, including Widow White and um, Mill Creek, where we've gotten inconsistent positives um, throughout the years. And of course, like, having one negative year or, or even two doesn't necessarily mean that it has been eliminated from the system. And I think that um, thinking so would be uh, a little bit incautious of us. So I, I do um, agree and hope that I have not um, <laughs> presented any sort of suggestion that, that once we have seen a negative that these creeks are like sudden oak death free forever or anything. Yeah, that's a good, good point and good note of caution to keep in mind. Um, also, Nikki Hansen has a message where you only test or a question, were you only testing for Phytophthora remorum or were there other Phytophthora species you tested for? Uh, that is a great question. Um, I was certainly looking for Phytophthora remorum specifically when uh, I was looking at the cultures that I was processing, but um, saw many other Phytophthora species. Um, I think that of particular note, we saw a lot of Phytophthora chlamydospora, which is not necessarily, um, as far as I know, it's not a particularly harmful Phytophthora um, in, in this area, but it's it's just, it looks very similar to Phytophthora remorum in terms of having really big chlamydospores. So that's like one that I have noted in particular this year. Um, but I, yeah, like we saw a handful of Phytophthora pseudosyringae, and I think like one case of Phytophthora nemorosa as well. Great. Um, other questions before we move on? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you so much, Wallace, for that update. There we go, thanks. Um, and I'm glad to know that um, our next speaker is is here and um, ready to go. I'm just going to do, I mean, Mateo doesn't really need any introduction to this group, but I'm just going to say a couple of things anyway. Mateo is one of the discoverers of what causes sudden oak death and how the disease happens, as it were. And he keeps adding to that foundational knowledge um, that he's been producing for, for many years. Um, and he also works on a bunch of other forest pathogens, too, as director of the Forest Pathology and Mycology Lab at UC Berkeley and a UC Cooperative Extension Specialist. And Mateo is going to update us today on one of the programs that has become indispensable to our year-to-year -year picture of what's happening with sudden oak death in California, which is the Sod Blitz program. Um, Mateo, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm actually on sabbatical, nine hours ahead of you. We had a pretty big earthquake today, but um, we do have electricity, and so I'm able to talk to you, and I will talk about the cell blitzes. Um, and I think most of you, I really don't have time to go through all the, the details about the blitzes, but it's a citizen science program, um, and it's really possible only thanks to funding that's available to us, and the biggest supporter has been Phil Cannon and State and Private Forestry and all of the people instead of private forestry, which have continuously funded the program. But we also have been funding for multiple years, but MidPen Open Space, uh, Mid Peninsula Open Space in San Mateo County. And also I have discretionary funds from pg and &E that I use for the program, but really the program wouldn't be possible without um, the people that actually, not the volunteers, of course the volunteers, but besides the volunteers, the program is structured very differently from other citizen science programs. Media that's community based. So we actually uh, ask for entire communities to participate in the program. And so these communities and also state organizations like state parks, uh, St. Mount Diablo National Parks, they participate as organizations. And that's what makes the program different. And I'm also thankful to Doug Schmidt in my lab that really coordinates, um, coordinates the program. We are now in our 15th year, I think. 
uh, or maybe 16th really. Um, and again, it's, it's a unique citizen science program for two reasons. One I already mentioned, the fact that we don't work directly with volunteers, but we work with volunteers through communities. So we work with local environmentalists. And so they're the, our point of reference. And the other big difference is that we, um, we actually share the results in kind of real time with the public. So there's no peer review, we just do the best we can. Sometimes we have issues and we fix those issues and we're getting better and better, but people want to know the results in real time. And so we do provide those results in real time. And so to just give you a, a schematic representation of the, the, the citizen, our program, it's a circular program with these local blitz organizers being really key. And then the volunteers being actually together, normally if they belong to the same community, and also we interact with the public in a very circular way where other pro programs usually are pyramidal. So it's a pyramid and everybody basically looks up to the organizer for, for activities. That's not how we do it. And that's why I think the program has been quite successful. Of course, two years ago, three years ago, we had COVID. I think we were the only large scale citizen science program to be allowed in the state. Um, and the reason for that is because in two weeks, uh, we have about 50 organizers that help us. All of us, we were able to generate these blitz stations outdoors where people would get all the information they needed, all the materials they needed. The training switched from in-person. I used to train everybody in person to an online training. Um, and then we also used to drop um, materials in the mail and receive materials in the mail. And this was authorized by the governor, the UC system, UCCE and UC Berkeley, and we never had a uh, lapse in, in the program itself. And one thing that I haven't sh shared really recently is how are we doing? And so what I wanted you to see here is that 2022, so the maximum is five. So people that come to the blitzes, they're not particularly knowledgeable, um, but they do rate the blitzes very well. So 4.5 out of five. And also very interestingly, 3.8 out of five, they're, if we find the disease in a property they manage, they're willing to do something. They're, you know, they're leaning towards doing something. And also below, it's if you look at the last column, is we have we only have 65% of their first-time participants. So about 35% are actually return participants. And we, we have shown in, in previous studies that that's really a winning uh, key for, for the program. And many things um, have come out of this program. I don't say that the program is responsible by itself, but it certainly facilitates a lot of discovery. It facilitates discoveries. And so the, uh, the Norton discoveries was facilitated at the same time, new hosts that are rare and endangered. And so sudden uh, death all of a sudden becomes a new threat. I've also been discovered thanks to the program. And so uh, there's, I wrote actually several editorials that are being broadly shared in the world of citizen science, where I, I really think that citizens are real scientists. So I believe that their data are actually absolutely very solid and they can be used in true scientific representation. One of the interesting things is that the program is pencil and paper on the front end. Uh, but the back end, so or vice versa. So we start, we, we let people participate with pencil and paper that we provide. But then once we have the data, we share it through a variety of platforms. The last one is Cal Invasives, which is hosted by Cal Flora. But we also have several um, platforms where we share the data in real time and we share with the public immediately. So that's again, one of the differences. So what happened in 2022? We had 24 blitzes um, from the Oregon border to San Luis Obispo. Uh, county. Um, we had 22 last year. Um, we had 254 collectors. So these are people that actually collect samples. Normally people participate as family or as couples. So we estimated we had 444 participants. Um, we surveyed about 10,000 trees, a little bit less than last year, but we sampled 1,805 trees. So it's, it's, it's a fairly large number. And um, Overall, the results can be summarized by telling you that we had the historical lowest number of positives ever since we started the program about 15 years ago. Um, even if we had a little bit of a wetter, a wetter year, that it really didn't matter because I think we are in this mega drought environment. And I'll show you some data to support that. Um, on the other hand, symptoms on oaks are on the rise. And the, those that are in, in, in the high, in the know, they know that that's not due to sudden of death, but it's actually due to drought related pathogens and drought related issues. But this has been a very confusing issues maybe for the public to, to, to realize because the symptoms are basically identical. 
So uh, people collect samples uh, using the materials we provide them and following very precise protocols. What happens at Berkeley? Well, since we had some problems about 10 years ago, we actually used two different assays. Uh, the, the two assays are DNA-based. Uh, most For most blitzes, we just process the material for DNA, but we use two assays that target two different loci and also use a different chemistry. One is DITS, which is a um, nuclear um, locus, and the other one is COX-1, which is a mitochondrial locus. And again, we use different chemistry just to make sure that there is no, no, uh, no, no problems um, with the results. In, in some cases, where, when we're looking at new counties, we actually culture everything as well. Although when you're in a mega drought, you know, we're, we're not hopeful that a lot of things will come out, but we do it anyway. And we also do the DNA tests on these new counties that we're sampling. And of course we have this issue of new lineages. So how do we determine whether we have a different lineage from the common NA1 lineage? Well, we have a portion of the Cox gene that we actually sequence. We sequence for every isolate this year and we have some SNPs. So these are three boxes that you see here. These are individual positions for nucleotides and they're different. You can see there's a little box, a key on top that tells you the differences so we can actually tell them apart. Um, so um, the, this, this year we calculated, we surveyed almost 150,000 acres, 18 counties. Um, and I told you we collected from um, 1,800 or 1,800 trees. Our test had a false negative rate of 0% and a false positive rate of 1.54%, which are really, really excellent numbers. And so if we compare this year with the previous years, we are um, in a, a comparable level. Um, what is what it changes the results is that our infection rate is really lower than any any other year that we worked on. This is kind of the data I wanted to show you in general. So as you can see, this is rainfall, which we know really drives infection by Phytophthora ramorum because we know that this the infection requires water for the swimming spores to fed the plant. And as you can see, the two go very well. But look at the end this year. So there's a like a scissor going on here. So rain went up, but infection remained low. And we think this is kind of really the effect of the mega drought. So we think it's it's a compounding effect. And so the pathogen is really having a hard time. And I will talk, finish my talk with some other reflections about why the pathogen disappears. Apparently it doesn't really disappear. We just cannot detect it in some areas. And well, when I present the data, although I won't really go into too much detail, we actually present the data by region, um, not really by county, because we believe these regions are ecologically different. So you can see all the different regions here. If you have any questions, you can maybe see what where, where you are and which, which region you're in. Again, I don't have time to go through the data, but believe me that in general, the, 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 the percentage of infection was lower this year than in previous years. But there are some cases where infection remained pretty good. A portion of Sonoma County, uh, central Sonoma, let's say around Santa Rosa, it's shocking how every single year that area remains positive. Southern Marine County was positive. Alameda County remains positive significantly. Parts of Contra Costa County and uh, San Mateo and, and, and most in the Santa Cruz Mountains, but not in Santa Cruz County, in the other counties, really remain positive. Big Sur, always positive. Uh, and uh, Carmel, also positive, but we see the pathogen retreated, retreating on the close canopy forest on the slopes of the, of the Santa Lucia Mountains. And we don't see those infections in the mixed savanna type woodlands that are more characteristic of, of the valley, of the Carmel Valley itself. San Luis Obispo was negative again. So um, this is a map on the left of all the data we collected. So I must say that after 15 years, when I look at this map and I see all of these colors and how much land is covered every year by these volunteers, I actually think it's absolutely terrific, absolutely amazing. I don't think we could do it any other way than this way. So it's very exciting. Um, okay, what are the most important findings? So uh, you probably heard already, sorry, I just connected, but so we did find the EU1. Um, uh, however, we found that we found it in two trees. Uh, they're only 350 meters away from the original finding. So this is better than last year because last year we were actually almost a mile away, but I don't know, those trees maybe were not sampled. So we're limited to the sampling, but anyway, so EU1 is still there. 
Um, most areas in Northern California, so Trinity, Siskiyou, Mendocino, and North Sonoma, including tribal lands that participate, they're all negative, which it doesn't mean that it's not there, just we cannot, we can't get it. Uh, Central Sonoma, I already mentioned, was really positive. But as we move east in eastern Sonoma County and Napa, all negative. Marine in the north part, all negative. But in the south, a lot of infection. Again, this is a mystery. Why does South Marine remain so positive? And Angel Island, again, after many years, became positive again. Obviously, it must be a climatic issue. Um, East Bay, many, many outbreaks. And we have two new reports. But I should tell you this right, on that, right away. These two, two new reports are based on a single sample. We retested it and it was positive, but it's one sample. One in Albany Hill and one, unfortunately, in Southern Alameda County near Suno, in a location that I call Layden Creek. Um, we sampled several nurseries. Um, they were all negative. Um, Natives here nursery in Tilton, it's a very important nursery for California Native Plant Society. All of their plants were negative, so it, we were really happy about that. But unfortunately, the trees in the, in the, the bee, um, uh, bee laurels in, in the area where the nursery is, those were positive. And um, again, in the peninsula, you will see some maps quickly. There's a lot of disease in the peninsula. It goes down into the more urban areas. And as you, you go up the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, it really increases. And there's a lot of um, preserves and parks that are run by open by uh, mid pen open space um, that that were positives and I think some of them were positive for the first time. However, as you reach the ocean, uh, for some reason infection um, disappears. At least we cannot detect it. Santa Cruz was not sampled very heavily, but everything was negative. And the Carmen Valley already talked about it. Big Sur once again. We don't know whether it's, uh, so maybe Sonoma is my fault and, and Kelly from Joseph's is responsible for, for sudden death in Big Sur. But Big Sur remains uh, incredibly positive. However, in the Southern part of Big Sur, Salmon Creek, which I've reported has been positive for many years, this year was completely negative. So again, I think something is happening that's a little bizarre. And, but that's good news for San Luis Obispo because we always said Salmon Creek is probably the source of the infection naturally if it doesn't come to plants. Uh, for San Luis Obispo, San Luis Obispo was completely negative. Um, people report a lot of symptomatic oaks through the survey, and we already talked about that. So we know that oaks are only infected when, and Melina spoke yesterday, she must have told you that. So oaks only become infected when rainfall is above, way above the 30 year average. We actually know how many millimeters of rains are necessary. So the oaks have not become infected since. Uh, 2017. And um, so everything that we see is, is mostly a drought, drought driven, and we were able to prove it. So every time we tested, we find a bot fungus normally in these trees or another fungus. And interestingly enough, um, a few nurseries that participate, two in San Francisco, one in the East Bay, the nurseries are all negative. So I think it's because management has changed also because of the CalFido program, but we also have to be careful because maybe the weather is also affecting the results. Some maps now to show you these results that I just mentioned. I already talked about the E1. It, obviously, it's, it's cause of concern. We have not got rid of, rid, rid of it. But um, and this is what um, Yana and, and Chris saw the very first year in 2020. Um, and you already have seen many plans. But this is a map of the positives. So you see, the, I put the year next to them. So 2020, we were the first. 2021, as you can see, 2021 was worrisome because it was really uh, expanding. Um, in 2022, the positives we had, but the sampling was very limited. We should have more sampling in this area. 22, the two positives, so again, it's, it's a solid positive. We're relatively close to, to, to the 2020. Everything else in the very North, uh, so Siskiyou, Trinity, and, and uh, maybe some of Humboldt County, if, if um, we're negative. This is the sampling size though. Uh, Mendocino County was all negative, uh, including uh, the Boomville, Philo area, which have always been positive. So, and in the very south, some uh, preserve area that normally is positive. Um, Sonoma, in the north part of Sonoma, and we said this repeatedly, northern Sonoma is very interesting because it goes back. I heard people saying, oh, it's positive is one year, not negative the other. Sonoma, def north Sonoma is definitely that. So north of, uh, of Hillsburg. Uh, when it's dry, normally we don't find positives. Once it rains, they become positive again. So obviously it gets probably warmer in this area and it affects the disease. Um, as we go to Sonoma, um, Sonoma West really 
fewer than usual positives. Again, it matches this idea that it's, it's getting drier, but also it's getting warmer. Let's remember that. And Central Sonoma, a lot of positives as usual, which is really, truly amazing. Sonoma Mountain, uh, significant outbreaks. But as we move east into Napa, then and Napa was surveyed pretty well. Uh, they were all negatives. Uh, North Marine, all negatives. I thought <laughs> very interesting. But South Marine, oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what's up with Marine, but really, um, it bas it's basically everywhere. So I suspect, I, mean, we, I suspect two things are going on here. One, the amount of the inoculum in Marine went really high. And so it really jump started the disease many years ago. And we're still, I think, even when it's dry, there's so much inoculum from the previous year that the disease doesn't really. Um, uh, go below the, the detectable threshold. And it's also cooler because of the effect of the Golden Gate. Um, East Bay, similar, probably because of the same reasons. So uh, John Muir, which is south of Martinez here, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, there's a big outbreak. It's always, every year that we sample there, we find a lot of trees. And then again, uh, the Oakland, Berkeley Hills, a lot of outbreaks, including some that are in urban areas. Um, again, the Albany Hill, it's a new report. I don't, I don't want to discuss the, the other ones, but we, we have found them before. Um, again, several of them are in urban areas. And then this is the first report in uh, South Alameda. That's the, um, in the Suno Regional Wilderness, the sample that you can see it clearly uh, as positive. Again, one sample, so you never know. It could be a false positive. You never know. So we don't like to make big claims about individual positives. San Francisco, Presidio, Golden Gate, and uh, North Peninsula, all negative. A nursery in the Presidio uh, and a nursery in Golden Gate, negative. So that's good news. Um, <laughs> Peninsula, again, uh, very you know frustrating situation where we have a lot of positives, both in the urban areas and also in the Santa Cruz Mountains, including I think many areas of our first reports here, but uh, just because we were sent, surveyed for the first time, thanks to the particip participation of MidPen. Um, Santa Cruz all negative, but it wasn't really sampled that well. Carmel, this is what we expect again. In dry years, uh, the canyons are positives, but we only have one positive outside the canyons, which is right in the middle of this picture of this one red, and everything else more, more in, the, in, the, in the patchy savanna um, type of, of, of environment and near the Carmel Valley, those were all negatives. And Big Sur, Again, every single tree to carry. I think Carrie samples these trees every year, all positive. But Salmon Creek, she samples these trees as well every year. And Salmon Creek was all negative, And so was San Luis Obispo. And so I wanted to finish with one reflection here. So uh, what we haven't really put enough energy. And I think a lot of the data that has come out on the models is from Tanook Redwood Forest. And uh, I think we, we actually cover both. but we worked more on the oak woodlands. And uh, there are three papers that we published where we have, uh, and Melinda talked about one of these papers, where we're really trying to identify factors that, that allow us to predict disease at different levels, at different scales, from the tree to the stand, to the topographical, to the landscape, and to the disease levels. So as I was saying, how much disease you have makes a difference, because if you have, a Really, if you have a ton of disease, you're probably going to see the tail of that for years to come, even if it's dry. And then we have this other factor of bay laurel recovery. And this has been known from a lot for a long time. I think um, uh, from the, the time in Dave Rizzo's lab, they were finding out that, it, but we actually modeled that. And we know there are several factors that actually explain bay laurel recovery, which would make a lot of sense for those areas that were positive and then become negative. And this is kind of a little summary that I made that summarizes 20 years of work. But basically, um, the areas that, that maybe have sudden or death more often are on the eastern slopes. Well, the disease, so larger oaks usually have more disease. High bay density, very significant. High oak bay proximity for looking at disease, not just an infection of bay laurels. High infection the previous year. So this has been modeled, and it's very significant, and high rainfall. So we know that rainfall is really important. On, on the on the conversely, if you have low bay density, then the disease really goes down. Smaller oaks, disease goes down. If you have larger bays, actually the disease goes down. So the disease really likes the smaller kind of uh, bays, uh, shrubby bays. And uh, the high temperature. So 
if when you have high temperatures, that is very, very significant in our model. In fact, it's actually more significant than rain in, in some of the models. And so I think as it gets warmer and it's getting warmer and we have less fog, I think temperature is probably, so I give rain as a given, we've always known about rain, but I think temperature has been underestimated. And actually more urbanized areas also lose the disease faster. And of course, if you have low infection the previous year. And then when do, when do bays recover? So I actually calculated that recovery goes way over 50% when the, the average maximum temperature goes above 23. I mean, this is average, but it's not very much. So as it gets warmer, really more than 50% of the bays lose the disease. This is based on large data sets and it's published. When the rainfall is less than 500 millimeters, let's think about this. So recovery of bays goes over 50%. And this is more, more likely to happen where the terrain is flat. So um, two more things. The program doesn't just sample bay laurels, but now we are partnering with tree care specialists and we actually sample oaks together, meaning that we train them on how to sample oaks. They send the plates to us, and then we ID the disease on this, I mean, the pathogen, sorry, on these, on these, uh, on these plates. So it's, it's a partnership to kind of pay attention to this very important component because we know that bay laurel comes before, bay laurel infection comes before oak infection, but people really care about oak infection and infected oaks can burn very hot, they can fall. And so many, so it's very important to do this. So it's starting relatively slow, but we're, we're already in our third year and it comes to a huge advantage. So by, by doing this, we've cut the cost of detection of the disease in oaks by more than 50% for private owners. Um, and there's a whole website where you can go. The program is called oakstep.org. Uh, that's a website. The program is called oakstep. And um, uh, people can actually get trained and then they can participate in the program. And then finally, the very last thing is we have this very interesting uh, complex, more complex survey about what people do once they have the data. So what, what do you do if you know you have the disease in your property? And these are the summary from this year. So we have 79 people responding and cumulatively, these people treated 2,500 trees over 740 acres. The average success rate was 78.6%, which is fairly good. So they mean they they didn't see infection in the areas that they were treating 78.6% of the cases. And this year, the average cost per tree was only $14. I should warn you that average years, the cost was one order of magnitude higher. So I think we're talking between $15 and $150. And so this is what people are telling us. And so we are, we're kind of getting the pulse for what, what people are doing about, about the disease. And everything I talked about today will be posted tomorrow. So the timing is perfect on our major um, main website for this, uh, for the diagnostics of sudden of death, which it's called sudden of sodblitz.org. And so here I put other, other websites, but really if you go to sod, so sodblitz.org, all everything that I presented today, including a much longer PowerPoint will be, will be available. And with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you so much, Mateo, for all that excellent information. Um, there is a question um, immediately here um, from Nikki. Um, is fog uh, an influence in South Marin? Well, yeah, so, so you know, um, we we did a study which we published about sporulation on tanox and bays. So we were looking at both and fog didn't really affect sporulation. But here we're talking about survival, right? Because we're sampling leaf material that often maybe doesn't even sporulate, but still, so those leaves are infected. And um, so I would say that while fog doesn't seem to be affecting sporulation, really we need rain. Uh, I do think it affects survival, most for two reasons. One, because, and, and um, I think DeLeo in, in Reasons Lab really published several papers showing that moisture made a difference for, different for survival in bay trees. And the other one is we have published several papers where temperature, we found out temperature is really important. So it doesn't like very hot temperatures, um, not even very hot, hot temperatures, it doesn't like them. So I would think that thought maybe does both. So it increases the relative humidity and also 
keeps the temperature lower. So my my guess is yes, I would say fog is very important in uh, uh, in maintaining in maintaining the pathogen. But it's interesting that yeah yeah yeah. Um, I want to note that Carrie Winninger um, posted a link to your webinar tomorrow um, where you will talk more about Sod Blitz results. Thank you, Carrie. And I have a question here from Mike McWilliams who says, when you Hi, say that they recovered, does that mean you no longer find infected leaves? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Of course, we're, we're not sampling all, all the leaves, but we are testing. Every bay laurel gets treated the same way. And we used, uh, I think, 25,000 um, data points. So 25,000 bays that were sampled and resampled. And uh, if you read the paper, it's a little bit complex. It's very mathematical. But the paper shows that where I pointed out those, those things were happening. So that um, the recovery of bay uh, in the model goes way over 50%. So that means that if you had, you know, if you had 60 bays, 40 bays will actually lose the disease. And the, the mechanism was already suggested um, years ago was the fact that they drop their leaves and they don't if they don't become reinfected. So those two things would have to occur. And we think that that's what's happening. But the point is in our paper, we actually quantify it. And we, uh, we did this um, multiple regression analysis to show what factor would explain the recovery. And the recovery was very significant. So it's not insignificant. It would, it's a recovery at the level that it would definitely affect disease. And really warmer temperatures make a difference. So I think that until the pathogen mutates, it will be really limited in its expansion by these warmer, warmer areas. Great. I have, a, I have a question for you, Matteo. Um, could you address um, what you see as the role of like competing other, other microbes that may, might be competing in some sites with, with Phytophthora remorum, like relative to the ambient mm -hmm. conditions? What, what's what's the, the most important thing? Well, that's that's a good point, and you know, we published a paper looking at uh, what was it, Emerosa and no, Cirrus ringi. What was it? <laughs> uh, we, you know, it's a large paper where in San Mateo County we we actually looked at the two of them. You know, how they were out competing each other, and it 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 in that paper the database the data was huge, right? We were like thousands of, of of data points that were sampled and cultured. That paper showed that, yes, so you have a good point, that when the conditions are dry, these other organisms, we, we tested one, but I, I don't see any reason why others couldn't. These other organisms are as good as Phytophthora remorum. So yeah, you're right. So I think uh, probably that is maybe the reason why we're seeing this effect now, it's a decoupling of rainfall and infection. So infection is staying low, even if rain is going up. Uh, well, there's two factors. One, some of the rain came after the blitzes, but even if we don't factor that in, we still notice the difference. Um, it's, I think that some other organisms are actually competing pretty well with remora. Unfortunately, what happens in our in our study, the moment they started raining, this population potential of remora is so gigantic that it overcomes everything. But I think you have a good point. I think it's not just the weather. I think these other organisms are really good competitors in a drier weather. The problem is that as we know, Ramorum is, you know, the most amazing sporulator we've ever seen, <laughs> you know, considering fungi and all my seeds. And so, and once it's, and it does it really fast, you know, it can, it, yeah. in 36 hours, it starts sporulating after rainfall. And so I think that that's the problem we're facing, but now we, with this continued drought, maybe these other organisms are really helping helping to 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 keep it a curb and maybe it's going to take more maybe we're going to see that when the, the, the next rain events it won't jump up as easily maybe because the, the 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 base point i mean the level of infection to start from is going to be lower and in all the models that's a key point so how much infection you have the year before and that's why when we have a lot of infection and disease we find a lot of infection the following year even if the weather is not as good for Ramoro, but we always see everybody, Dave agrees, we always see this in a, there's a saddle, there's a saddle year, and that's mostly driven by how much inoculum there is in the wave year. Okay. Thank you, Mateo. Um, and if you can't stick around um, until the end, if there are any other questions that people think about, um, hopefully we'll have a little bit more time to, to discuss some things. 
Um, and we will move on now to our next presenter, who is Grayson Badgley. Grayson is a research scientist with the Carbon Plan in San Francisco, which is a group that works to improve the transparency and scientific integrity of climate solutions with open data and tools. Um, Grayson holds a PhD in Earth System Science from Stanford University, and he has published widely on the nexus of forests, forest health, and forest productivity, and carbon-related issues. We're delighted to have him turn his attention here to standing carbon in California as it relates to forest health issues, including sudden oak death. Thanks for being here, Grayson. The screen is yours. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for both uh, the introduction and the invitation to be here today. It's really um, exciting to be uh, addressing an audience of uh, that I, I normally wouldn't uh, interact with. I'm, uh, my training is as, as a forest ecophysiologist, but I'm not a pathologist. Uh, I kind of backed my way uh, into being interested in uh, uh, sudden oak death and uh, in this really surprising and what you might think is an unexpected talk. Uh, the title of my talk is California's Forest Carbon Offsets Buffer Pool is Severely Undercapitalized. Uh, we're going to break down what that means, but what I am most excited to share with you today is this really, uh, what I think, unexpected result that we found that sudden oak death actually might have quite serious implications for California's cap and trade program and its overall climate ambitions. And this has to do with how California tries to use trees and the management of trees uh, in order to manage atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. So uh, that's what we're going to cover today. A little bit of a change of pace, but uh, uh, I promise that we'll talk a lot about sudden oak death. All right, let's make sure I can change my slides here. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with thanking um, my uh, colleagues at Carbon Plan. Uh, it helped co-author a paper that appeared this year in Frontiers in Forests and Global Change. I also wanted to thank a number of people on this call, including Matteo, uh, Doug Schmidt, a number of other people who uh, I just called them up send them emails. I, like I said, my background is not, I'm not a pathologist, but uh, I have found every single one of my conversations with this community to be um, uh, friendly, uh, in, people engaging. And so it's really, um, again, uh, it really is an honor to, to be here today. All right, so let's move to an outline of what we're gonna talk about. Really gonna be three parts to my talk. First thing we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about California's forest carbon offsets program. Uh, and we're going to talk about California's cap and trade program. We're going to talk about offsets, how these things work. So we're going to spend a little bit of time making sure we've got all those mechanics down uh, so that the rest of the talk um, uh, is, is relevant to everyone. The next is we're going to talk about this thing called the buffer pool. And the buffer pool is a way that California's offsets program tries to manage forest risks. Risks, excuse me. So um, uh, the program is all about sort of trying to cultivate additional carbon being stored by forests. But as we know, trees can die uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, and so you need to manage that risk. And there's this mechanism that they've called that they have called the buffer pool that's designed to manage that, to manage that risk. And finally, and this is where we're going to start to talk about sudden oak death, I'm going to make the argument that that pool, that insurance mechanism, is ill-prepared to deal with things like wildfire, things like sudden oak death. Um, and uh, again, this is uh, uh, how we'll get to um, uh, sort of the most potentially most relevant um, aspect of this research to, to the audience that we have um, uh, joining us today. So let's do a two-minute introduction to California's forest offsets program. Uh, we'll start with the California cap and trade program. Uh, this is a program that covers about 75% of emissions in the state of California. And uh, in effect, what, how this program works is that all emissions of CO2 uh, from large industries, so you know, people are refining oil or cement factories, uh, sort of like big industry, they need a permit. So if you put a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, you've got to turn in a coupon uh, with the state that sort of gives you the right to, to put that pollution into the atmosphere. And there's two ways uh, that you can satisfy that requirement, sort of that uh, you know, sort of turning in your, your, your right to, to pollute. The first is allowances. So uh, the state uh, go, has gone out and sort of existing industries in the state of California, they go out and they say, hey, you guys have been in the state of California for a while. Um, 
we're just going to grant you some allowances based off of your historic emissions. This is going to allow you to continue um, operating. And over time, we're going to sort of ratchet that down. Um, in addition to those sort of allocations that happen, uh, the state will also auction off some of their credits. Again, so uh, they'll open up the, the auction house uh, companies that sort of are, uh, that are polluting. Uh, if they're pollution, if they're if they need a if they need to put more CO two into the atmosphere, they can come to that auction and they say, hey, I need to I need to buy some some credits over there. I uh, I'm going to need to turn these in at the end of the year. Uh, you know, I'll pay you this much. And so there's those those allowances are auctioned. And again, those decline over time. Uh, and the idea being here is that as the cap, the total number of emissions that are allowed goes down, this helps rein in emissions at the statewide level. Finally, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is industry can also turn in offsets. And these are, um, uh, rather than the company uh, taking steps to reduce their emissions, they can pay somebody else, uh, elsewhere in the world, in order to take an action that draws down atmospheric CO2 or prevents atmospheric CO2 from going up, sort of avoids an emission. Uh, and uh, the state has rules for how this accounting is done. And sort of uh, what we're gonna talk today is about this last bit, about uh, industry paying specifically forest owners. So I've got a little asterisk there at the end is that there's lots of different types of offsets in California's program, but the vast majority, about 80% of them are forest carbon offsets. Uh, and that uh, is what we'll turn to now. So what is a forest offset? Uh, sort of coming back to that framing of cap and trade, it is a license to pollute. So you've got a factory, uh, it puts a ton of CO2, a molecule of CO2, any amount of CO2 up in the atmosphere. And uh, there's a tree somewhere else that pulls a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so from an atmospheric standpoint, uh, there's no change in the atmosphere, right? There's no accumulation of carbon dioxide. Now for this uh, approach to work, the money, there needs to be sort of a change of money uh, or, or sort of a, 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 a change of, um, the, 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 there needs to be a change in management of the forest that's induced by the program, induced by money, by the sort of the polluter paying the forest owner to do something new so that additional ton of CO2 gets thrown out of, out of the atmosphere. So you could think about this, um, uh, let's say I have a forest and uh, I planning to cut, chop it down sort of on a natural rotation of 80 years. Instead of chopping that down, uh, maybe I get paid by, uh, I, I just say, I'm gonna sign up for these carbon offsets and I'll leave my trees where they are. So rather than the carbon in my trees being released in the atmosphere, as would happen in a sort of business as usual scenario, because I receive some money, um, the, uh, I'm not going to cut those trees down uh, and I'll sort of draw down extra CO2. And in this instance, money changes hands from the polluter, the forest owner, and the atmosphere uh, is uh, sort of not affected by, by that pollution. The immediate question that you have to ask yourself is what happens if something happens to your tree? Because when we emit CO2, fossil CO2 into the atmosphere, that CO2 basically is going to live in the atmosphere for time immemorial. It's, it's effectively immortal. Uh, whereas the uh, amount of the carbon that is in trees, we know that that is uh, subject to all sorts of different disturbances, uh, uh, either uh, natural or you know, sort of biotic agents, but also sort of uh, management, uh, things like um, harvesting or um, development of subdivisions, all sorts of things uh, can, can affect uh, the carbon balance of, or sort of the carbon that is stored, that is stored in trees. And so in order, uh, in, in this in this situation, you would sort of have an unbalanced equation of where you're sort of trading a, a committed emission from, the, from your sort of power plants uh, in exchange for uh, uh, CO2 that, that doesn't stick around in the land surface for, for all that long. And so in order to manage uh, this, uh, to prevent this sort of thing from, from happening, uh, the California systems come up with a pretty clever system. Uh, it's an insurance mechanism called the buffer pool. Buffer pool is very, very straightforward. Let's just say I have a, a forest carbon offset program and it sort of generates 10 tons of CO2 worth of climate benefit. So uh, we got uh, 10 little blocks that are all stacked up here next to each other. Each one of those blocks represents one ton of CO2. So uh, uh, the, the state of California says, uh, you know, given the change in management that you've made in your forest, we say that that is that has led to the avoiding 10 tons, it's it generated 10 tons of CO2 
benefit. Rather than allowing the forest owner to sell or to sort of lay claim to all those benefits, the regulator says, okay, you generated 10 tons of CO2 worth of benefit, but we're only going to allow you to sell eight of those tons. You only get to sort of keep eight of those tons. You only get partial credit. And instead, based off of risk factors that are specific to your property, you're going to take 20%, about 20% across all projects of those benefits and deposit them into a buffer pool. And then if you sort of think about it, if we kind of go across a lot of different projects, you know, each one of them would have their own little different risk factors. Each one of them is contributing a little bit into the buffer pool across a whole portfolio of projects. We all of a sudden would have this reserve, this reserve of real climate benefits that we could then dip into in case anything happened to one of our forests. So for example, let's say a fire breaks out in one of the projects. So we've got three little fires here. You just go to the buffer pool and you'd say, okay, we lost three tons of carbon. We lost three tons of climate benefit from these fires, but that's fine. We've got all these tons over here in the buffer pool that are reserved. We generated these benefits, but we didn't let anyone lay claim to them. We didn't let anyone sell them. You do the same thing for, you know, so mugs come around or maybe there's wind throw, a drought, you know, basically uh, any sort of natural disturbance, um, unintentional disturbances as they're, or unintentional reversals as they're called in the program can be handled in this buffer pool um, insurance uh, scheme. And the critical thing is that the buffer pool is designed to last for 100 years. And it's sort of this balance of CO2 goes in the atmosphere for effectively forever. And we wanna make sure that our carbon that is in these forests that we're paying for sticks around for something that's relevant for um, sort of taking effective climate action. It's not 10 years, it's not 20 years, but they sort of settled on, okay, we don't need to deal with forever, but what about a hundred years? In a hundred years, uh, a lot can change. We'll have a lot of new technologies. So if we can keep the forest carbon, the buffer pool can stay intact for a hundred years. Uh, we will have had an effective, uh, we will have effectively used trees and the carbon stored within them to help combat climate change. Let's transition to what the buffer pool actually looks like. So we were talking about a schematic uh, of how the buffer pool works. And this is actually what it looks like uh, in real life. Uh, to date, about 31 million tons of CO2 have been deposited into the buffer pool. Uh, and the sort of risk factors that the buffer pool cost, uh, covers are things like wildfire, disease and insect, uh, other natural disturbances, again, wind, throw, drought, and then uh, financial uh, financial and management considerations like bankruptcy. Um, so this is a contract. Um, so if, you know, if a forest owner goes bankrupt, um, the bankruptcy court could discharge the whole offset program. And the, the really important thing, uh, the important thing here is that uh, in order for the buffer pool to last for 100 years, we need to make sure that each one of these uh, areas, wildfire, disease, and other natural disturbances, is reflective of the actual risk of those events occurring uh, to the forests that participate in California's forest offset program. So, uh, you know, what I, essentially, um, if if the disease and insect uh, component uh, gets eaten up, you can sort of dip into the wildfire component, or you can dip into the financial management program. But if you if across all these risks, you have all if the if the numbers aren't uh, right across all the risks, you can be into this scenario of where. Uh, there's undercapitalization of the pool and the real risks to the pool um, might exceed the total size of the buffer pool, in which case the environmental integrity of the entire program would be called into question. And this is where we can get to sudden oak death, is that it turns out that these natural risk factors uh, for fire, disease, and other, many of them are actually constant, regardless of species or location. And uh, we're a room full of uh, folks who study uh, forests. Um, and hopefully this is the point where you start to be somewhat concerned of where this means that you can put a forest into California's forest offset program, regardless of its species composition and have a, a risk factor that is unadjusted for the actual species that are present in your, in your project. And this is a big problem. Uh, because it turns out there's an awful lot of tan oak that has been enrolled in California's forest offset program. By our calculations, about 14.2 uh, million tons of CO2 are stored in tan oak stems that are enrolled in California's forest offset program. 
The total size of the pathogen buffer that California has to date is 5.7 million tons of CO2. And again, that buffer pool is meant to last for 100 years. So you have 10 oak uh, that are incredibly susceptible to sudden oak death that are supposed to stick around for 100 years. Uh, and the amount of 10 oak is about three times the total amount of buffer that has been allocated towards the risk of pathogens across all forests that have been enrolled in this program. And I first realized this was a problem when I read this paper uh, by Cobb et al. in the Journal of Ecology in 2012 and sort of shows on the x-axis the uh, years since infection and on the y-axis the proportion of basal area of tan oak uh, that experiences mortality. And you can see that uh, with some of these modeling studies and modeling studies that have been repeated since this time, uh, the basal area, uh, you know, the, effective, the effective amount of basal area that's left over as we go farther and farther in the future uh, is vanishingly small. And so sort of based off of those, uh, this idea uh, that tan oak um, is very vulnerable to sudden oak death, uh, we developed three scenarios. And actually, I should really thank Matteo. Matteo uh, uh, helped design these three scenarios. I'm not sure if he recalls the long phone call that we had with each other. But the three scenarios where we said, well, what if there was just 50% tan oak mortality for projects that sort of occur in the cool, the cooler range of uh, the tan oak of, of where tan oak uh, can exist, so 50% mortality for projects where the me or the annual temperature is below the median of tan oaks, uh, sort of of tan oak temperatures across the full range. In the second scenario, we said, what if there's 50% tan oak mortality for projects that have tan oak and bay laurel, sort of recognizing that bay laurel is this uh, sproulator that can sort of lead to rapid expansion of disease and. And finally, we sort of took a more Cobbian uh, uh, approach where we said, okay, what if there's just 80% tan oak mortality across all projects that have tan oak inside of them? And when we laid out that analysis against the disease and insect component of the buffer pool, we found out that um, in the low case, uh, about 82% of the buffer pool th that is set aside for pests and pathogens is entirely encumbered by sudden oak death, one forest pathogen. In scenario B, it goes up to 100%. And then when you kind of get to those really extreme scenarios, you know, you can really exceed the expectations that the program has for pests and pathogens over the next 100 years uh, with, just, with just sudden oak death. And it's really worth driving home that it's just a single disease, right? There's other things out there like the adelgid, um, there's, uh, you know, gypsy moth, spotted lanternfly. You know, there's all sorts of other diseases that this program needs to be ready to take, to take into account. Uh, and so it is quite worrying that there already is so much tan oak out there um, and, uh, and the, the buffer pool uh, appears to be so small. Um, uh, I realize I've, I think I've already gone a little bit over time, uh, but I really want to just sort of finish on one one other note is you, know, you might be thinking, well, maybe some other parts of the buffer pool could sort of be dipped into and that would allow us to sort of make up for uh, this deficit that we have in the pest and pathogen pool. And, uh, you know, so you, you got all these these credits in the pool that are cross fungible. It turns out that if we actually, in the same study, we looked at estimated fire losses that are today and we did sort of a similar analysis. So this is fires that have happened in enrolled carbon offset projects, uh, fires that have already happened, uh, whereas our sudden oak death analysis is kind of looking forward, we find that there's a really high likelihood that the buffer pool for wildfire that's designed to last for 100 years is actually also already been exceeded. And so the fact that you have two parts of this buffer pool that seem to be undercapitalized really calls into question if the overall environmental integrity of this program um, is going to be sustainable uh, in the long run. Okay. Uh, that's uh, me talking long enough. I'll leave uh, up a picture of this, uh, of the buffer pool here. Um, and I hope that I have a minute or two for questions. Uh, apologize for running a little bit long there. That's great. No problem, Grayson. We, we do have time today. And um, you do have one question already. And the question from Carrie Olson is, so the buffer pool is comparable to a rainy day fund? And maybe, you know, after your question, after you answer that yeah. question, you could ponder the implications of that for us. Well, I, I think that I think that's a good way to think about it is that it's, they're, they're saying that we, we generated, you know, according to the rules of the protocol, we generated a hundred, we generated a hundred units of good, a hundred units of climate good, tons of CO2. Talking about tons of CO2 can be a little abstract. So I like sometimes to say a hundred climate benefits. And they say, okay, just in case we did something, just in, because we know disturbance is gonna happen, we'll just only allow 80 of those credits to be transacted out in the world. 
And then if we ever need them, we'll have these 20 in reserve. And when you spread that out across, you know, tens, you know, I think they're nearing 100 projects now, you know, the buffer pool can you know, be quite, quite large. Uh, the real question is, um, is it large enough? And I think that the, the thing that I find very concerning is that these risk factors don't take into account known variations in species in, in, in the types of diseases that affect um, uh, affect uh, you know individual species and and I think that you know for you can imagine that there's they had to sit in a room and come up with all the rules for this program they wanted to apply to forests all over the United States and it, it, it kind of makes sense that they didn't really think of this kind of funky endemic tree that lives in you know only in California and, and Oregon and uh, anyway uh, it's um, it's an interesting it's an interesting conundrum. Well, that actually segues really well into the next question, which is from Ted Sweeky, who asked, where did these buffer pool parameters come from to begin with? In other words, what was the science behind them? Yeah, you know, I, as far as I know, I haven't been able to find a sort of really clear documentation about where they come from. There's been some uh, work by investigative uh, journalists um, published maybe a year or two ago from uh, the news outlet Grist sort of talked with some of the original um, drafters of uh, of the um, of the protocol, and they sort of talked about you know, there's a, a small group of people in a uh, they got together in a room and really tried to put their best effort together. But uh, and uh, and so it's not but sort of exactly what evidence that was based on. I don't know if we know exactly, and I, I think it probably was a really good effort at um, at the time. But I think that one of the things that's I think. Um, I think this group would probably agree with is that you know we really uh, for us for us and the things that can hurt that can kill trees it, it, it's it, it seems to be changing all the time you know like think about wildfire I mean a decade ago you would not have imagined that wildfires could be as intense and severe and as frequent as they are now I mean we kind of knew we were headed there but I think we thought it was a way like a little bit farther off things like drought induced mortality I mean uh, you know, my colleagues who study drought mortality, and they're just constantly surprised at just the severity and just, just the sort of, you know, how in your face it already is. I mean, again, we kind of knew we were headed that direction, but, um, you know, so I think that uh, climate change is really um, uh, supercharged a lot of these things. I think at one point in time, we're kind of like, felt kind of more academic -y concerns, and all of a sudden we're seeing them on the landscape. And it's, um, I think it's caught a lot of people I, in off guard for all sorts of understandable reasons. I think now the question is, how are we going to respond to it? Great. And Yana also reminded us, or Yana points out that um, she knows of at least one forest re inventory that showed that carbon was lost due to sudden oak death. So that certainly matches mm -hmm. sort of your observations here. Yeah, interesting. One of the one of the cool things I didn't have a chance to stuff into my presentation today is uh, thank you sod blitz I was able to download all the sod blitz data and, and if you get if you dig into the paper we are actually able to overlay the sod blitz data with where California's forest carbon offsets projects are and we could say there, there was one example and I think it might have been a screen sample I don't know I should talk to Mateo about this or um, Wallace about this uh, but there was actually a positive uh, Photophora remorum sample inside of one of the projects. Uh -huh. uh, there's other projects where, you know, you're talking about two or three kilometers away. So uh, this thing, yeah, anyway, uh, it's, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we start to see, if we start to see these um, in the years to come. Obviously, there's a really complex interplay of factors here. This is going to be so interesting to watch. And thanks for calling our attention to, you know, this, this sort of subject that we need to be paying attention to that our task force, you know, it, you know, our focus on the biology of this organism, sometimes we we kind of lose sight of these other things. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks so much for the invitation <laughs> again. Absolutely. And um, so let's move on um, now from that really interesting talk to Carolyn Lambert, our last presenter of the day. Um, and Carolyn, correct me um, when when you start to talk um, in what I know about you and what you do, because this is my perception of your job. Um, Carolyn manages the Sudden Oak Death Program for the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And in that capacity, she helps county agriculture departments to enforce 
the quarantines that USDA APHIS and the state of California um, have for a sudden oak death and um, specifically related to establishments that um, grow and sell plant products, such as nurseries. Um, and her job involves coordinating lots of inspections at regulated establishments every year among other activities. Um, Carolyn is a member of the California Oak Mortality Task Force Executive Committee. And so we really appreciate her service to the task force. Um, her updates that she helps us with in the bi-monthly newsletter and her presence to update us here online today on what's going on with nurseries in California as it relates to Phytophthora remorum. Um, so Carolyn, are you ready to go? Yeah, I am. Uh, thank you for that introduction. That was right on and probably the best way I've heard my job described. <laughs> I like that. Um, let me see, how do I, oh, share screen. Okay, here we go. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, I, uh, I work for CDFA. I'm an environmental scientist. I'm with the Interior Exclusion Program. Um, I am the state contact for the Phytophthora Morum slash Sudden Oak Death um, program, and um, I've been doing that for about six years. Um, I work with the counties, and we uh, regulate nursery stock, so we stop the movement of Phytophthora remorum through uh, nursery stock. Um, so just so a couple of quick updates. I, I'm not sure if this was already touched on, but um, last year, Del Norte was added to our state quarantine and the um, the federal quarantine. It hasn't shown up in the regulations yet. It, it does take some time to add um, new things like counties, new infested areas. So we're working on that now. And uh, so is the USDA. They did issue a federal order last year um, updating that as well. Um, there are no regulated establishments in Del Norte, uh, like nurseries or green waste establishments. We don't have any compliance agreements signed for that county yet. Um, in California, Del Norte brought us to 16 infested counties. And when we go to the nurseries and do our inspections, we use a host list. And that host list has proven hosts and associated hosts. And this is just a little bit of a uh, blurb about the justification, the rationale for the lists. Um, you can find the most current host list at the, um, the USDA APHIS website, their landing page for Phytophthora remorum. And actually the host list was updated in September of 2022. And here at CDFA, we were just alerted to that. Um, I just learned about it this week. Um, and so did the counties. So we're still uh, looking at what the differences are. It looks like a lot of additions. Um, this is on the slide here, an example of the proven host list and the new additions there. Um, so when we're uh, doing our inspections and, and our doing our regula regulating uh, um, nurseries, there are two types of nurseries in the Quarantine counties. There are host nurseries, which are um, Exhibit B. It's part of the compliance agreement that we give them. And then non-host nurseries, they receive an Exhibit J. Um, exhibit B nurseries, they're inspected um, once, well, once a year and sampled during that time. And then they also are inspected um, every 30 days or 30 days prior to a shipment out of the quarantine area. Um, and those nurseries, they would ship with the federal shield there, and the lower right corner of the screen, or um, if they're shipping intrastate, they would use the certificate of quarantine compliance, which is above right there. And the non-host nurseries are inspected once a year just to make sure that they don't have any host material. They also use the CPC or the Federal Shield to ship out. So we total in California, we have 288 regulated establishments. Um, those consist of 
host and on host nurseries, the ones I just talked about, exhibit B and J, we have 165 of those. And then um, the rest of the establishments are made up of, um, you know, greenery, garland weeds, um, establishments that sell soil, um, tree farms, they call it for holiday trees, um, firewood, um, green waste, compost, transfer stations, landfills, and all of those establishments are also inspected uh, during the year by the counties. So when a county, uh, sorry, when a nursery comes up positive, um, we they're considered a previously positive nursery, and there's an enhanced inspection that goes on at those nurseries, um, and that happens uh, six times um, or for three years uh, biannually, and the nursery can test out uh, that enhanced inspection protocol if they have six negative inspections. Um, if they test positive, um, the count restarts and they're stuck in the program again for another um, three years. During that three years, the, the nursery will need to um, pre-notify when they ship their, um, when they, when they uh, ship out of state to receiving states. Uh, we have seven enhanced nurseries, uh, enhanced inspection nurseries. Um, the counties are there. We're doing the biannual inspections right now. Um, one of them is receiving their last biannual inspection. So fingers crossed, and that is negative. And then we'll be down to six. In 2022, we haven't had any positive nurseries so far. Um, so we're, we're doing pretty good. Like I said, we're doing our, um, second buying an inspection at the, at the big nursery right now. So we're, um, we're hoping we can come out of the year with, with zero. So the last time we had zero uh, positive nurseries was in 2015. Okay, so the lab, sam uh, they processed um, a little over 7,000 samples for the year. And we had 145 positive samples. Our trace investigations uh, were negative. We had no positive trace forward or back samples, and um, viburnum was the only plant that we were we were looking for this year. Here are a few of the resources that you can use if you'd like to know more about our regulations. Um, the USDA uh, regulatory program manual is there. It has our inspection and sampling protocol. Um, there's our CDFA website. And then that's the end of my presentation. And my email address is there. If you have any questions later that you think of, feel free to email me. And I think I have a couple minutes here for questions, if there are any. You do indeed, um, Carolyn. Thank you for that presentation, um, Tanya Chapel would like to know, is there a process for knowing if a nursery is or has been positive for Phytophthora morum infection in the state? Um, there is a regulated establishment list on our website that shows um, nurseries that can, that are certified to ship out of the quarantine area. We do not have a public list of previously positive nurseries. Okay. And I have a question for you. Um, I thought it it's interesting that the um, the zero positive find years, you know, were years that were coming after a couple of preceding dry ones. And I'm just curious whether you commonly in, in this inspection regime of nurseries, even though nurseries are somewhat separated from the outside environments in some ways, depending on the nursery, do you commonly think of sort of our environmental conditions in the state as being linked with how many positives or negatives you're going to find? 
Um, we wouldn't go on records saying that, but it certainly seems like that ha is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah. Other questions for Carolyn? Oh, and Tanya has a follow-up question. Are there any best practices regarding nursery sales into uninfested areas within quarantine counties? Uh, best, like the best management practices. We do have a, a manual that we developed um, for best management practices. Um, I believe that's available through our website. Um, for nurseries that sell um, pure and more host material, they are required to source from other certified nurseries. So those nurseries have been inspected and um, found to be free from pure and All right. Other questions? All right, Tanya says, thank you. Um, and I echo that thank you, um, Tanya. Um, I mean, uh, Carolyn, well, both of you, thanks to both of you. Um, so now um, we can um, entertain other questions for any of our speakers that might um, still be around. Um, oh, here's another one for you, Carolyn, before, before we leave your um, presentation. Do you sample for Phytophthora cinnamomi or other, I guess, by extension, other Phytophthora species? Um, for the pure worm inspections, we're looking for symptoms for pure worm, but um, if the lab determines that it is something else, yeah, we, you know, that goes on record and we let the county and the nursery know that some other species of Phytophthora was found. Okay. Uh, we also do our, our annual nursery cleanliness inspection. So that, and that's sort of a more general inspection where we look for any symptoms of any disease or pest. Okay. Um, and another one just popped up from Faith Campbell. Um, the issue of nurseries testing in a dry year is a real issue. Is there some way to address this? Um, do you need clarification about any part of that question or is that clear? The issue of nurseries testing in a dry year is a real issue. Um, like, so uh, in a dry year, there's not a lot of symptoms. Yeah, and maybe, um, Janice, is there any way to unmute Faith so that she could maybe articulate exactly what she's looking for? All right, Faith, it looks like you're unmuted. Yeah, uh, that, that line in my question is a negative. There she is, a test negative in dry years. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. And, yeah. and how do you mean that it's a real <laughs> issue? In what way is it a real issue? Well, we see it in California. We see it in Oregon. Nurseries test negative. People think they're fine. Then it rains and they aren't negative. It's, um, it's just waiting and it's not showing up. And then the plants get sold and all of a sudden we have a trace back situation. So the, the system is not really catching the infected plants. And I'm, I'm not trying to accuse anybody. I think it's probably extremely difficult, but if, if, yeah. if we're gonna to continue to ship plants, we need to have a better way of making sure they really are clean. Okay, yeah, thanks for that question, Faith. Um, Carolyn, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, we follow current protocols that were developed by experts in the field uh, for sampling and um, testing. Our lab does a great job um, with the diagnostics, and um, we, you know, we have eradication protocols when we find it in nurseries. So hopefully, it is it's not in the nursery. Once we find it in in the future, um, it's. Yeah, we, we do the best we can. Um. All right. And I, I call attention to Tyler Bray's comments in the chat as well for anyone who's interested in this thread of the conversation. Um, 
other questions or thoughts uh, um, for Carolyn or for any of our earlier speakers, if you have thought of anything that you want to ask, other than Mateo, who had to uh, who had to take off. Um, and then some more comments are coming in um, related to Tyler's comments, um, related to stream sampling. Um, Faith has some thoughts about stream sampling. Um, in the Southeast, many streams have tested positive for a year, but no positive plants are found. That, that definitely is analogous to that same situation that we have in Humboldt County in McKinleyville that Wallace mentioned. Um, and Faith says that um, she hopes scientists across the country will collaborate to determine what interactions there are between plants and water. Um, and that, that issue of plants near water or in water and whether they're hosting this pathogen has been definitely a head scratcher for a long time. But yeah, it's definitely a big and important one. Um, and Susan reminded um, us that um, maybe Carrie Frangioso is willing to chime in here and get unmuted and just let her know a little, let us know a little bit about what's going on in Big Sur with sudden oak death this year. Do you mind doing that, Carrie? Yeah, no, not at all. Um, yeah, so the, as far as Big Sur, I just have to start with the caveat that most of the area down here has been burned um, that we've been sampling. So we had, we've had three major fires, 2008, 2016 and 2020. Um, in those burn areas, we don't see a lot of mortality or a lot of disease coming in. Um, we are starting, we started to see some symptoms in the, um, the area that burned in 2008, but most of it, um, I think this corroborates with what everything else we've heard here. Um, a lot of the symptoms look very old. Um, they, they're not very active on tan oak. Um, another caveat is that we did not actually sample anything this year uh, due to budgetary constraints. So this is all just based on symptoms. But as far as looking for leaf symptoms on bays, um, that was very far and few between, uh, save for the, the areas that um, didn't burn um, or were heavily um, uh, high bay density areas. Um, you know, everything in the unburned area, which would be the most southern part of Big Sur, um, is starting to look like what the Big Sur Valley used to look like in the early 2000s, um, where there's just massive amounts of standing dead tan oaks, uh, a lot of fuel on the ground, um, uh, really horrible fire conditions uh, down south. A lot of, we're losing tan oak pretty, pretty fast down there. Um, uh, like that's especially in the Willow Creek, uh, Plaskett and Salmon Creek areas. Um, yeah, I think that's what the, those, that's like the main update from, from here. I'm, I was interested to see that all the positives in Big Sur came back positive from the, from the stream, from the sod blitz, um, but not so much in Salmon Creek. That's kind of interesting. Um. I also think it's interesting and need to remember that even though we're not seeing positive results from the saw blitz, it's sitting there waiting for conditions to return and that we are seeing mortality still in, in trees that have been infected previously. Um, it definitely made me think about, okay, these trees are stressed from the disease and they may be actually dying now because of the additional stress of drought. Um, so anyway, just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and I think that's, it's a really good point. And it's, it's a good point to remember that with many Phytophthora pathogens, not just Remorum, um, they are really well equipped to deal with environmental extremes, you know, these extremes of lots of rain and then very little rain, lots of rain and then very little rain. Over the long term, that may actually be um, play out to the benefit of the pathogen um, and to the detriment of the trees, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Thank you, Carrie, for letting us yeah. put you on the spot. Sure. No problem. Much appreciated. No problem. Observations. Um, and um, 
So there are some more comments that um, you guys should check out in the chat about um, diagnostics. Um, but I am going to go ahead and thank all the speakers. We're not quite done yet. I have just a few more things to call to your attention, but thanks to all the speakers who gave us uh, so many wonderful updates today. Um, that was all very helpful information. Um, everyone had good questions for them, and it's very much appreciated that you joined us today. Um, I wanted to talk just a bit because this is sort of um, the, the task force in general, it's not just conditions on the ground update, but a little bit of an update for the task force too. And so I just wanted to take five minutes to mention some of what um, some of us have been thinking as far as the task force goes and changes that are coming down the line. Now, the first thing that I wanted to do as part of that is I wanted to do an expression of appreciation. Um, and that expression of appreciation goes out to Susan Frankel today. Um, Susan ha is, is at a point where she has planned her official retirement from the USDA Forest Service within the next year. And um, maybe we'll be able to have another task force meeting of some sort before that time. But just in case not, I wanted to be sure to appreciate Susan, um, who has been involved with the task force from its very inception. She was a co-founder of this group. Um, and she was one of the original people to call attention on the ground to this problem that was eventually identified as sudden oak death caused by Phytophthora remorum. Um, and she has done innumerable things to keep um, the task force um, operating, to keep it focused, um, and to um, organize the task force's activities over the years, um, including, you know, not least keeping um, a, a scrupulous record of what happened with Phytophthora remorum from that discovery point all the way until today. Part of that record keeping has taken the form of um, the suddenoakdeath.org website and its bibliography. Part of it has taken the form of uh, monthly and now bi-monthly newsletters um, that Susan has edited. Um, and the, that we I want everyone to know that we have been discussing what will happen in the future. We have a plan for um, how the newsletter uh, might continue to keep those records and who might be able to help um, take on and share that burden as we go forward into the future. And um, we, we don't know exactly, you know, Susan will decide in the future what her projects are that she's still going to be involved with. And, and um, she will articulate that to, to those of you who um, are interested, no doubt. Um, but we, we will be continuing the work of, of keeping records on what happens with sudden oak death and, and informing people about it into the future. Um, a couple of things that we've discussed recently. Oh, and I should mention that any of you who are interested in becoming more involved with that work of keeping information flowing and keeping um, tabs on what's going on with sudden oak death, you know, please um, get in touch with Janice, get in touch with me, any other member of the task force executive committee. It's on our website, suddenoakdeath.org. Um, and, and we would welcome your help and participation. Um, a couple of changes that we are thinking about for the future. Um, they both in ways um, involve the suddenoakdeath.org website in integral, in, you know, uh, important ways. Um, one is that we are looking toward our name, the California Oak Mortality Task Force, and we're looking to the fact that um, that encompasses more than only sudden oak death, as important as it is, and that we see a lot of things um, threatening oaks um, from diseases to insects to wildfires to anthrop anthropogenic um, impacts and we wanted we want to help serve as an information repository um, for some of that information um, particularly things related to other disease and insect problems as they affect oaks and so as we go forward we're going to post um, links and further information about some of these other agents not at all taking ownership of that information from the people who've developed it and um, 
posted it on their own websites, but just providing some signposts to those websites and filling in with original documents some of the information on some of the things that haven't been covered so well in, 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 uh, in the past. So look for that, look for the, the task force website to take on you know, an additional section or two with information about additional disturbance agents. Um, and then we will continue our um, maintenance of the website and our review of the website looking at, at uh, links that are broken and, and things that need to be updated in particular. And that's another one of those things that we welcome your input and your participation in because keeping information updated, as you know, um, is a perpetual challenge. Um, and so we're, we will keep moving forward. We'll keep you um, apprised of what those um, moves are and changes and um, and and we'll be happy to hear from you at any point. And I'm wondering if um, Janice or Susan, either one of you have anything to add to that that I've forgotten to mention. Lots of appreciation coming in for Susan in the chat. And, and Chris, if, I, I think you covered everything that we needed to talk about. So you're good there. Okay. Um, with that, I'll close the meeting today um, with thanks again to everyone and um, a special thanks to Janice for uh, running this show and coordinating this. And um, I'll say bye to everyone. Oh, and a reminder to join us tomorrow um, when we'll be talking about um, other phytophthoras and um, our phytophthoras and native habitats work group. That'll be a great meeting. Thanks, everybody.